Greetings and welcome to the 2020 Safety Components First Responders 911 Charity Golf Classic. This is our 19th year of hosting this event and it's an event that we're all proud of at Safety Components and proud that we can continue to support our first responders and the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. Obviously 2020 has been a difficult year for all of us. It's been difficult on our businesses, it's been difficult on our families, it's been difficult on our ability to travel and see friends, see the many first responders that we are able to service through the year, see our customers, but we didn't want let that to hamper our ability to continue our charity golf work. So with that, we decided back in August that we could no longer host an in, uh, in facility event at Thornblade Country Club this year, and we decided to instead host a virtual golf tournament. I don't know that there's ever been a virtual golf tournament, but this may be the first, and if it is, great. But um, so we, we decided to let every team play anytime, play anywhere. Just send us your team information, your team photos. We put it together into a virtual dinner that we're having tonight that we hope you enjoy. One of the things that I'd like to say that, you know, this golf tournament and the work that we do at Stop, Drop, Rock and Roll, we've raised well over a million dollars over the lifetime of our foundation. That's something that we're proud of at Safety Components and something that we'll continue to support. I'd like to thank all the sponsoring teams for coming back this year and continuing to support our event. Most of you have been with us for many years. I'd like to particularly note Lion Apparel who has sponsored 16 teams in this year's event. And without the support of our sponsors, we wouldn't be able to have this event and we wouldn't be nearly as successful as we've been over the past 19 years raising funds for the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. One of the issues of COVID has been our ability to get out the sponsor uh, team gifts. So we're running a little bit behind being able to get all the sponsor team information, the addresses and so forth. So we'll be getting those out sometime the early mid part of December. So hopefully it'll be a nice Christmas present. Our speaker tonight is Brendan McDonough of the Granite Mountain Hot Shots. He was the lone survivor of the Yarnell fire tragedy a few years ago. He'll share his experiences from that event, talk about the issues that firefighters face every day and talk about the good work from the National Fallen Firefighters as they, as they supported the families from that event. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. I'd like to thank you for participating in the golf tournament, for attending our dinner, and we hope to see you again in 2021, hopefully here in Greenville, hopefully at Thornblade Country Club, like we have in the years past. So thanks again for attending, thanks again for your sponsorship, and thanks for your support. Thank you.
Hello everyone, and welcome to the Safety Components First Responder 9-11 Golf Classic for 2020. As you may know, this event is normally held at the Thornblade Club in Greenville, South Carolina. As with everything else, we are adapting because of the pandemic, finding new ways to carry on our efforts and our mission. So I'm excited to participate in this virtual golf classic and extend my personal thanks and appreciation to Joey, Sylvia, and the entire Safety Components team for making it a reality. Your efforts to support first responders everywhere and the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation is just outstanding. This annual golf outing has become a premier event for our fire service industry. I am so glad to see it continue during these tough times. A big thank you to all the participants, the sponsors, and supporters who have committed to making this event possible this year. We appreciate the assistance it brings to our Fire Hero families and our fire service community as a whole. Here at the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, the pandemic is hitting us hard. Most of our in-person events have been canceled, and that includes our outreach programs and our fundraising efforts. We even had to postpone the National Memorial Service. However, this year we produced America's Tribute to Fallen Firefighters, a program that honored those who died in the line of duty in 2019 and previous years. This tribute was not to replace the actual memorial service. That is scheduled for October 2021, where we'll be honoring nearly 250 individuals from 2019 and 2020. That service will also include those individuals who died from World Trade Center disease, occupational cancers, and the COVID-19 virus. To date, 92 fire and EMS personnel have died because of the pandemic. And we are actively working with their departments and families to support, assist, and grieve with them. We continue to deliver our programs and services as best as possible through virtual and electronic means. We are also assisting in person when a line of duty death occurs by following pandemic safety guidelines. Even though the pandemic has slowed the efforts of many, the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation continues to carry on its mission. Our work continues to be cut out for us, and with their help, we are making a difference. So thank you for your support and your efforts to make the fire service better. I hope that we'll be able to gather in person very soon, as I would love to see all of you and share a moment to catch up and reflect on all that has occurred since the last time we were together. Be safe, thank you for all you do, and thank you for being a part of this virtual golf classic. Hello everyone, my name is Brendan McDonough. I'm the lone survivor of the Grand Mountain Hotshots, and I am extremely thankful for Safety Components having me a part of this event. I know that we all want it to be in person, but I think it's just as special to see it come together and such a testing time for many of us and all the support that it's received. And just really thankful for Joey Underwood and what they do for the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation. And what I wanna do is just kind of share a little bit about my story and the support I've gained and where I'm at today. So it starts at a young age. I was a lost youth. I was struggling with drugs and different substances and, and getting in and out of trouble and kind of couldn't find my traction until I heard about the fire service. And so I had these two polar opposite lifestyles. I had one to go to the fire explorer program and dreams of becoming a firefighter, but this addiction just kept, kept me crippled in my life. And when I graduated high school, I found myself in a situation in the fire academy for structure. And when I was in there, I met a guy through um, the academy that was in Wildland, and he talked about hot shots and what hot shots do and how they really fight fire and how they get to travel the country. And it was kind of like an army salesman almost just kind of pitching me on this career. And so that's when I started to take this shift. And a lot of people were telling me, hey, if you want to get hired on the structure side, 
you know, definitely look into becoming a wildland firefighter because it's something they really appreciate. And as I progressed through school, I still had this addiction problem, but had this dream of becoming a firefighter. And it wasn't until I flunked out of my EMT class and my world kind of started spiraling down in 2010. Um, I found myself in jail and just lost and broken with a kid on the way. After getting released from jail, uh, I was in there for about a week and I got re-enrolled back in my EMT class. I thought to myself, I've, I've got to get my life together and I've got to, I've got to chase this dream that I want to, that I want to have and I want to be something different. And so I re-enrolled in that EMT class, but continued to struggle. And it wasn't until I overheard some guys talking about an opening on a hotshot crew, the Granite Mountain hotshots. And they told some other other men in the room, hey, show up tomorrow at 9 a.m. We've got, you know, two empty positions and we'd love to hire you. And a lot of people kind of knew who I was, so they weren't talking to me, right? And as I thought to myself, I, I need to be there. And not only do I need to be there, but I need to beat them before nine o'clock. And so I showed up at 8 a.m. and I had my resume in hand and I'll never forget walking into the station. And as I walked in, I saw some of the guys from my class and I said, hey, just want to drop off my resume. Overheard you guys have some hirings and some open positions and you know, just want to leave this here with you. And the response was, not what I expected. And it was kind of expected, but not really. And they had told me, you know, hey, we're full, uh, better luck next year, maybe try a different crew and kind of just chuckled and, and walked off. And so with my head down, I, I walked out the door, but I, I knew I should have known better to expect that. And so as I'm opening that door, the superintendent of the crew walks out of his office and he looks over me and says, son, what are you doing here? I said, I just came to drop off my resume, but I heard you're full. And he said, we've got one open position. Why don't you come take a seat for an interview? And so I'm getting excited. I'm like, this is it. But then I start thinking about my past and everything that's gone on and everything I've done that hasn't led to just being deserving of that moment. And we sit down for this interview and we're, we're going through it. And I'm, I'm a pretty good chatter. I'm a pretty good talker. And... We end up getting down to some nitty gritty questions about, you know, my legal history and things like that. And I see some guys in the room kind of shaking their head, you know, thinking like, what are we, what are we doing? We got so many other applicants. And at the end of the conversation, we called the HR department and even the lady on the phone in HR was like, sir, we've got so many other applicants. And he just said, just trust me. And I'll never forget that moment. I'll never forget you know, just finding that trust that someone had in me that I couldn't even find in myself. And Eric Marsh, my superintendent, seeing something in me and believing in me when I didn't even believe in me. And so she says, all right, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll figure out the paperwork, send them down here. And so I had a job, but I also had this addiction that I needed to kick. And I had a daughter who was just born a month ago and I'm just grasping for change in my life and leadership. And so I show up Monday for that first run and I am not in shape. And so I'm dead last in the run. And finally the superintendent catches me halfway through because he'd stay back. And that's kind of what he did come to find out is he would stay back and encourage people as they were going. And so he's running with me and I'm thinking, A, I'm either getting fired or B, he's gonna come alongside me and give me the encouragement I need. And that father figure I've been looking for for a long time. And he's just silent. And as we're running, we come up this big steep hill. And I'm thinking, maybe he's gonna run this hill with me. Get me up this hill and he'll take off. Cause he can run a lot faster. I can hear him kind of angry at how slow I'm running. And so we get to the bottom of it and he looks over at me and says, son, if you quit today, you're gonna quit the rest of your life on your daughter. And in that moment, I, I could have gotten angry. I could have been upset. I could have been disappointed. I could have left. I could have given up on that dream. But I realized that this man was trying to motivate me to get me to where I wanted to be. And that's exactly what he did. That day forward, I stopped quitting on myself. I left drugs in the past, left that lifestyle in the past, and continued to build amazing relationships within the fire service, as many of you know. And it would be a struggle the first, first month of just physically trying to catch up. And I'm still in this EMT class, but I'm doing better. And I've turned my life around and I found not just a not just a job, but a career and a brotherhood 
and a level of accountability and men that really wanted to, to teach me and wanted me to be at the same level, if not better. And it helped me be a, a father and a member of my community to give back and to be the exact opposite person of I was a year ago, just taking everything I could receive and not thinking of others. And so I fought my first year of fire in 2011. I loved it. I was 19 years old. It was a huge rush. And I was back in my daughter's life, just really making amazing changes. And I would go on to, you know, make beautiful friendships and just that sense of brotherhood that, that only comes with, you know, working with someone day in and day out and really getting to know the deepest part of who they are as their being. And that's serving others. That's who we are in the fire service. And so I'd go on to go through my second season. I'd asked to come back and I was just thrilled that, you know, they, they saw something in me that I didn't know I had. And so I'd go on my second season and I would, you know, learn so much, not just about firefighting, but myself personally and create amazing memories and really just had just such a, a sense of purpose in life. And going into my third season, it was time to start thinking about structure firefighting because I was um, sharing custody of my daughter and I wanted to be home more and, and a little more consistent. And I sat down with my superintendent and had that conversation. I was afraid at first, but they really supported me in that and said, hey, you know, let's get through this season and we'll start looking and seeing how we can get you plugged into the structure side. That year, we would go fight a fire on June 30th, 2013, and 20 of my, 19 of my brothers and myself would hike into a fire, relatively small, a lightning strike, and as that day would unfold, the weather would continue to change, and I would be separated from my crew from being the lookout and potentially being cut off by fire, and this weather event came in and, and completely turned this fire around. And as my brothers were making their way out their escape route, we're watching this community burn and we're just trying to figure out what's going on. And at that point in time, I'm two and a half years into my career and I'm starting to second guess like what, what's gonna happen. But I started putting my trust in their training because we train, 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 and train. And there was, you know, so many years of experience on that crew. And then I hear that call that they have uh, deployed their fire shelters. And I remember thinking to myself, I've got to remain positive. And at this point in time, everything ceased on the fire. We've had everyone evacuated, and now we're trying to get to them. And we can't get in through the roads because there's, there's just too much fire on the ground. There's propane tanks that are going off, and it's, it's, um, it's pretty chaotic, and we don't have radio communication, so they finally get a helicopter up and there's a paramedic on board and they land and he hikes down and I'm just anticipating what's going to happen. Like we need to get in there. We need to have medical services ready for him and they're being flown in and ambulances are coming in. And we hear over the radio that they've got 19 confirmed. And I'll never forget where I was sitting. I'll never forget the person to the left and right of me because I thought to myself, I, I told you there's 19 you know, what do we need to do to get them help? And it, and it hit me that I had just lost my brothers, that I had just lost everything that made me the man I was up until that day. And I couldn't, I couldn't function. I couldn't function. And as this is unfolding, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, God, why couldn't you have just took, taken me earlier? Why can't you just take me and let them live? Because I come from a broken past and these men were so passionate about what they do and their families. And I, and I just couldn't stop asking why. And that night they would get all the families together and former crew members and people that had known them personally together at the middle school in town. And I was supposed to be dropped off at home, but I wanted to go there. I wanted to see the men that I had worked with on that crew previously. And I wanted to just be there and try and be of help. And I'll never forget walking in that door and just seeing the distraught brokenness across the whole auditorium. And that's when the guilt and shame just started to sink in. And from there, 
I would attend funerals and memorials along with the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation that walked alongside us with so many resources to help us, but I wasn't willing to help myself and I wasn't willing to receive help, even though it was there. I couldn't say yes. I couldn't raise my hand and say I'm, I'm broken. And so I suffered for years struggling with PTSD and, and I didn't turn to drugs, but I turned right back to the bottle. And I drank and I drank and I tried to drink away the memories that I couldn't let go of, the things that haunted me in my sleep. And it wasn't until I was actually at the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation Memorial that a counselor approached me and asked me, hey, Brennan, how you doing? And as I sat there, I thought to myself, I'll just tell her the same thing I've told everyone else. I'm doing okay and I'll, I'll just be fine. But something led me to tell her I'm broken. I'm, I'm not okay. And I did. And so we chatted for about an hour and a half. She said, Brennan, we're going to find your resources when you get home. And so when I got home, she called me and set up a counseling appointment. And so as this young firefighter, I'm just like, this isn't going to work. I've tried it before, but I've got to stay open because I can't live my life like this. And it's living hell. And as I went to this first counseling session, I just sat there, just quiet and broken and empty. And the counselor would ask questions and I'd have one word answers. And finally, she just, she knew how to get to me. And she said, Brennan, if you don't open up, you're not gonna get through this and you're not gonna be the father that you wanna be. And from that moment on, I just dumped everything that I had on her from, from the memorials to the mortuary to just the, the news clips, everything that had haunted me that I couldn't get out of my head, the anxiety, the depression, the suicidal thoughts, I just let it go. And we would start to unpack those things through counseling and we would start to deal with the trauma that I had been through and walk through it. And it was painful, but each and every time it began to become less and less of a burden that I had to carry. And it wasn't until I found a relationship with God that I was truly able to find ultimate healing. I, uh, after about nine months of counseling, I was anxiety free, suicidal thoughts weren't even, weren't even on my mind. And I started to begin the process of quitting drinking. And so now today I can say that I've got three and a half years sober and, you know, it, it was so pivotal in my moment of life to have that counselor walk in at that memorial in Emmitsburg, Maryland, and it couldn't have been perfect timing. You know, and I'm just so thankful for those resources that are out there and for people that are willing to, to be there for us, like the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation, like Joey Underwood's company, Safety Components, putting on this amazing golf charity tournament to give back to those who are in need. And since then, I've been able to start a recovery center for addiction and trauma to give back what I've been given to first responders and civilians and it's, it's hold fast recovery. And that's what's been my calling over the last two and a half years. And I just, I just can't say it enough for you, those of you that are watching, just thank you for participating in this fundraiser because it, it goes so far. It really does. The ripple effect sometimes we don't understand, but the ripple effects leads to saving lives like mine and helping our brothers and sisters that are struggling. So I hope that you have an amazing time out there golfing with your loved ones. I hope that you enjoy the virtual event and that you can find a little bit of peace in just getting out there and being together and knowing that we're doing an awesome job for an amazing cause. We've got men and women that love us and support us through these difficult times that we're going through. So thank you so much for just sharing time with me and listening. And I hope you have a wonderful uh, evening and just really, when you get out there, just crank them hard. I'm horrible at golf, but as long as you get it far, it'll go somewhere. So take care. God bless. And thank you so much.
A shocking par three hit right there. Where's word of the day, guy? Word of advice, right here. What's your word of advice for the day? Your company's gonna see it, by the way. Just saying. Leave it clean. 